All right, if you open your notes, as I said, there were, uh, uh, Paul says more in his epistles to First and Second Timothy about the church than someone has said, and I believe it, all of his other writings put together. And so we're going to, we will not be looking at Philemon tonight, but you have the notes on that. We're going to look at 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Now, if you remember the, uh, the last few epistles that Paul wrote, he wrote as such, he wrote the epistles, um, what, what is called the, the prison epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and Philemon during his first imprisonment. And then he was released probably a two-year period, and then he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus during his release. So he wrote to 1 Timothy during the release, and then he was rearrested right after the burning of Rome in 64 AD, uh, probably by Nero, and then he blamed it on the Christians, and then uh, to be a Christian was a felony, and it would uh, involve the death penalty. So he's rearrested at Troas, interesting, where he saw his uh, great vision to come over in Macedonia. He's arrested there, and uh, he writes then his final epistle during his last imprisonment in Rome, 2 Timothy. So we'll look at both these incredible epistles tonight. Okay, 1 Timothy. This book was written, page 1, um, to instruct Timothy on how to effectively relate to and deal with the various groups of peoples in his church, including himself, church officials, false teachers. In addition, Paul also reviews his own ministry and aptly summarizes the person and work of Jesus Christ. Some believe that uh, First Timothy, there is at least one ancient hymn and maybe two ancient hymns sung long before How Great Thou Art in the local church and probably taken from First Timothy. We'll read those words a little later on. One is found in chapter 3, one is found in chapter 6. Bottom line introduction, from an old, from an old man of God, and that's uh, the Apostle Paul, to a young man of God, and that's Timothy. Okay, page two, unique features. The book of 1 Timothy is the first of three New Testament letters written especially to pastors. He wrote most to churches, to the church of Philippi, to the church of Rome, to the church of Thessalonica. But he writes these to individuals, to Paul. Paul writes to Timothy and to, to Titus. Um, and uh, number two, the New Testament has much to say about Timothy. His name appears 24 times. He was from Lystra and probably was saved during Paul's first missionary trip. In fact, many believe that uh, Timothy and his mother and grandmother, his father was a Greek and an unbeliever, but his mother and grandmother, godly women, and they trained him in the scriptures as a young boy, that uh, they were there when Paul was stoned and almost left. Well, he may have been, he was left for dead. He may have been dead. And God miraculously, uh, you know, brought him back to life again if he were dead. And uh, so probably shortly after that, Paul, uh, uh, Timothy was saved. And I have an idea that his mother and grandmother had been saved before that. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, number six, he is invited by Paul to join the team during the apostles' second missionary trip. Paul made at least three and maybe four missionary trips. The first one, we could, uh, we could probably uh, categorize it as the uh, dynamic duo. You have Paul and Barnabas. But then the second, you have the fabulous foursome. You have Paul and Timothy, and uh, you have uh, Luke, and the fourth one here. Let's see, Paul, Timothy, and Luke, and I can't remember the fourth one here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they were with Paul during the second missionary trip. Okay, um, yeah, Silas, yeah, Silas, Paul, Luke, and Timothy. And number eight, Timothy may have been chosen to take John Mark's place, who was a mama's boy, and he chickened out and went back home after the first trip. But Paul has a lot to say about him as a remarkable, great uh, illustration here of the God of the second chance. And uh, so Paul wants to see him right before he dies in, in 2 Timothy. All right, skip down to 13. Like Paul, Timothy also suffers imprisonment. And he performs, Timothy, a ministry in at least five New Testament churches. Uh, he was uh, the, uh, uh, he's the, the tr trouble uh, solver. And uh, so Paul would send him to various places. 
Uh, page 3, number 15. Timothy may have had somewhat a reserved individual. He may have been a somewhat reserved individual and one who did not always enjoy robust health. In fact, uh, Paul wrote him later and said uh, to drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities. So whether it was an emotional or whatever, but uh, in spite of that, he was a man of God, and God can use. I think Paul was an extrovert, and Paul was a was, a, and a Timothy was an introvert. God can use all of us, uh, because we have been foreordained before the foundation of the world unto good works, according to Ephesians chapter two, verse ten. All right, uh, number seventeen. He was uh, on two occasions. Paul reminds Timothy in regards to his spiritual gift. He writes in First Timothy. Neglect not your gift. Now, the gift was pastoring and uh, probably uh, ministering the gift of mercy. He had several gifts, but don't neglect them. And the second Timothy, he writes, he said, stir up the gift of God that's within you. Uh, the, the word stir up in the Greek is rekindle. And so Paul had to sort of, you know, um, encourage him. Hey, listen, uh, you know, don't uh, lay down and, and don't pout and doubt and and uh, lay down and stay down. Uh, get up and, and fight the good fight, Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. But he was, in spite of all this, he had a problem. He had human nature, just like the rest of us. I used to think uh, when I was learning some of these great heroes in the Bible that these guys, uh, they were born in Sunday school classrooms, maybe here in the temple somewhere, you know, and, and they drank communion juice, and uh, they didn't have ring around the collar, and they didn't have uh, excedrin headaches and, and pipto baz pipto but didn't have stomach aches. <laughs> and, uh, but, but James says that these were men of like passions. And so whatever drives you up a wall now, like I'm not pronouncing. Hello, this is Joe Biden here. And I want to say. Uh, <laughs> what, oh, uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Would you want this man to be? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Wait up. Well, at any rate, uh, I'll grieve the Holy Spirit here, and uh, certainly want, I don't want you to know what I'm thinking politically, okay? I'm trying to keep, <laughs> trying to keep that a secret. Uh, number 18, this official provides the most extended list explaining the needed qualifications for pastors and deacons in the New Testament. Uh, 19, it also includes the first of three passages in Paul's writings where he predicts last day conditions. And uh, if you want to know where we are right now, uh, 1 Timothy 4 and then 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4. That sort of gives a, an outline uh, historically or prophetically where we are right now. Uh, number 20, uh, the reason for man's headship over the woman is also given in this epistle. It emphasizes the importance of doctrine on eight occasions more than can be found in any other Pauline epistles. That's why we're going to start the great uh, doctrines beginning in January. Doctrine is a simple word. It's a word that uh, people are afraid of, etc. And well, isn't doctrine uh, trying to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or can God make two mountains and put them together and not have a valley in between? And can God create a stone so big he couldn't lift it? Well, that's all nonsense. Uh, doctrine is the systematic presentation of the great truths in the Word of God. And uh, so we'll start in with the doctrine of salvation. And uh, I'll have eight or ten questions after we finish the doctrine of salvation. We'll look at justification, sanctification, glorification, and then certain questions in regard to doctrine. That'll be part four of the study. We'll take about five or six weeks. Now, I'm beginning to push this because this will be very important. Uh, what about, uh, how many of you have uh, lost a little one in death? Okay, a number of you, eight or ten looks like. Uh, what happens, uh, what is happening to that little one? And where is the destination of those that uh, have been aborted or stillbirth, miscarriage, uh, died at birth, shortly after birth, before the age of accountability? And not only that, another question, what about those who have never heard? Is there any hope? And I've done a lot of study on that. And 
What about salvation and the Mormon church? And this will blow your mind. And I've, I've read probably 1,500 pages and trying to really get my uh, mind around uh, this very interesting uh, overview of the Mormon church in regards to doctrine. That's very important, too, because not only, uh, hopefully we may have a, a Mormon for president, but uh, it is the fastest growing religion in the world. And it is the, one of the wealthiest, the av- well, I'm getting into a lot of stuff here, but, but the average uh, Mormon family has probably uh, twice the income, and they've, they've earned it honestly, uh, than non-Mormons do. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, they're educated, 75% have college education, as opposed to the Jehovah Witnesses, where maybe 20%. So uh, are they cultic? Are they Christian? I, I'm going to say they're neither. I think they're a religion. We'll talk about that, but you need to know that information. Okay, uh, but it's doctrine, doctrine. Okay, and then uh, number 22, it records, uh, 1 Timothy, on two occasions where a sinning believer was delivered over to Satan. Uh, Number 24, it is believed that the words in chapter 3, verse 16 and 6, verse 15, uh, can... how did you pronounce it? Uh, constituted an early church hymn. Number 25. This epistle is the only of all Paul's epistles in referring to Pontius Pilate. And then uh, Paul sadly records the fulfillment of his Acts 20, verse 29 and 30 prophecy. In this epistle, uh, he says this to the elders in Ephesus. He said, also of your own selves, you know, the enemies within inside the church, Shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? Number 27, for its size, the epistle has more separate names for Jesus, 17, than any other epistle. And number 28, the apostle gives us more information on the following subjects in this book than can be found in any other epistles. Pastors and deacons, an entire chapter on that. Uh, The role of women in the church, widows, riches, uh, elders, and uh, etc., and then the comparison with other Bible books and titles and names for Jesus. You can see the 17 listed here. Uh, one of them is in, uh, interesting. If you look at it on page four, uh, number 15, the uh, he's the only God, the only potentate. That's the only time that's mentioned in the Scripture. The Lord Jesus is not only King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but He's the potentate. Okay, on page five. The book of First Timothy, and I've, I, I did, I, I will see this pretty soon. I've treated Second Timothy in a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. But in First Timothy, the six chapters, I've treated them not chronologically but topically. And we're going to look at. Uh, sorry, I skipped around here. We're going to look at uh, five different topics: Paul and the family of God, and then uh, Timothy and the family of God, church officers in the family of God false teachers in the family of God, the Savior, and the family of God. So we begin with Paul and the family of God, and he gives an overview, as he does in a lot of his epistles, uh, in regards to how his own role plays out in uh, his ministry. He was an apostle. He was a father, not a married father, but a spiritual father to Timothy and Titus and others. Uh, He was a former blasphemer. He became a sinner saved by grace. He thus served as God's trophy, as we all will in the days to come, years to come, throughout eternity. He was a suffering servant. He was, most of all, a preacher. Now, I want us to read uh, his message, his mission field, and his master. Most of all, he was a preacher. Uh, His message, reading the gospel. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. His mission field, Simon Peter was sent to the Jews. He was sent to the Gentiles, reading, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and variety. And then uh, his master, the Savior, reading, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who had enabled me for that he counted me faithful and putting me into the ministry. That's what he says about himself now. Uh, Roman numeral two, uh, Timothy and the family of God. Timothy's personal responsibilities. Next page. Paul says, stay in Ephesus. Now, he had trouble with some of his, uh, we call them preacher boys, because Titus was in Crete at this time, 
and Paul was in Ephesus, and both of them wanted to, hey, put my name in, you know, to another pulpit committee here. I want to get out of this place. And so Paul tells Titus, stay in Crete. Stay just where you're, where you're supposed to be at this time. And he says the same thing to Timothy. He says, as I, as I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. It's important for the sake of Christ and for your own spiritual growth that you stay in Ephesus. And then maintain a good conscience examine yourself, take key unto yourself. And the Bible says, you know, if, um, if the vessel is clean, we don't have to worry about uh, the message. And we begin our ministry by taking heed to ourselves. Remembering the old Puritan that says, uh, when the danger, the, the saying, the little statement there, the proverb, when the danger least thou fearest, then the tempter snare is nearest. And it is my solemn conviction that the only sin a born-again person cannot commit is the sin of blaspheming Christ. I don't think it's possible if the Holy Spirit lives within us. Having said that, that uh, opens up a lot of sins. He can, she can, including uh, adultery and immorality and thievering, all the rest. Take heed because the scripture says, uh, let him that thinketh he stand, let him beware, lest he fall. All right, take heed to yourself. Examine your doctrine. Discipline yourself. Be an example and develop your gift. God has given us all spiritual gifts. And when we come, probably our third doctrine next uh, year will be we'll starting with the doctrine of, the, of, the, of uh, salvation, doctrine of Trinity, then the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and spiritual gifts. And we'll spend a lot of time on that. Because just as sure as God made little green apples at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, God will say to you, as he'll say to me, Harold, and put your name there, what did you do with the gift that I gave you? And ignorance is no excuse. So we're going to help you find out what your gift is. But he says, develop, develop this gift. It, it's like a rough diamond. And uh, we're to utilize it and practice it and learn by it and, and, uh, and use it as much as we possibly can. Uh, so he, tell, he told him, Paul, to develop your gift. And on two occasions we said, he said, stir up the gift of God and don't neglect the gift of God that God has given you. And then take care of your body. Drink no longer <clears throat> water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. And I'm going to get into this, whether this teaches, uh, allows for moderate drinking. I don't think it does. But even if it does, there's another passage that says that uh, never we are not to be a stumbling block. We are to remember the weaker brothers. And Paul said, if the eating of meat, and I think he could say of moderate uh, drinking, causes my weaker brother to stumble, I will not eat meat in this case or maybe drink wine as long as the world stands. And so it's not, uh, is this okay for me? But what about my testimony? Okay, and also, I think it probably, as I have it here, this verse all can be used to support the position that I take, uh, that the spiritual gift of healing through individuals may have been phased out even before the completion of the New Testament. Now, I definitely believe in divine healing. I have a problem sometimes as I watch television with the divine healers. But, uh, but as far as God, you know, Paul could heal people. I mean, and Simon Peter, just a, a shadow would fall on, deaf, uh, on people that, that couldn't hear and couldn't see, etc. Uh, I think that gift is, Paul had the gift, apparently, but then he sort of, it was phased out because he couldn't heal Timothy. And Timothy was a man of God, but he said, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities. And then he could not heal Trophimus. And he says, uh, as he writes to Timothy, he says, you remember Trophimus? I left him sick at Miletus. And then uh, he could not heal himself. Apparently in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he had this thorn in the flesh. So I think that gift was phased out. All right, and then another, th avoid the love of money and pursue the good, good, on page seven. Be a soldier and be impartial. And uh, that's Timothy's private responsibilities. Now his public responsibilities concerning the pulpit in the church. He says, till I come, and he was going to visit him, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Now I think the, uh, I think the pastor is to do this. Sometimes, I've been in probably 
three or 400 churches, at least more than that, probably since I've been here. And often the last 10, 15 years, I'm asked the question, what do you think the greatest need in the average local church? Some more than other church. And, and I always say this, that uh, the, to begin or at least to continue, if that's not the, happening now, the systematic presentation of the great doctrines in the Bible from the pulpit. Because Paul says, in the latter days, men shall not endure sound doctrine, but be given over. And he talks about this here later on to doctrines of devils. Satan, I have 12 doctrines that we look at. The doctrine of the Father, Dr. Son, Dr. Holy Spirit. I don't know how many doctrines Satan has, but he has a systematic theology also. Uh, the doctrine of hell. And so we need to know the true from the false. Okay, and... Um, at um, page 8, um, he talks about concerning women in the church, their responsibilities, and their, their restrictions. Uh, he says on one occasion, I would that the older women teach the younger women. And I want to guarantee you, for every 100 pastors that have fallen, probably in the last month across America, maybe more than that, probably 90%. Uh, those um, godly men have let their guard down and have uh, been counseling with younger women. It's fine to counsel with another woman as long as your wife is there or some others. But to let the godly older women, that's one of the responsibilities, uh, one of the most important responsibilities in the local church. And... Uh, then he says in the middle of the page, do not allow congregational doctrine to be taught by a woman. And uh, I'm going to give you uh, Kenneth Weiss uh, notes there. You can talk about that. I think probably the only, and whether it's an associate pastor, I wouldn't argue with uh, assistant, maybe uh, deaconess. But I think the only, at least office in a local church that a woman as I understand, cannot occupy, according to 1 Timothy 3, is that of a senior pastor. We'll talk about that pretty soon. All right, and um, at the bottom of page 8, uh, he talked, well, let's see, uh, on page 9. Uh, he, now, concerning, considering widows in the church. Protestant churches, Baptist churches have let down grievously on this. In the, book, uh, the books concerning Mormon that I'm, that I'm reading now, during the Great Depression... Uh, when uh, tens of thousands of uh, Christian people in the great dust bowls out west uh, wound up and we used to call it the poor farm. Uh, you remember that? Uh, yeah, you, you, you better be careful. And Mom would tell the kids, uh, you go to the poor farm. They didn't have what we have today, Social Security, etc., until Roosevelt came along. And I think that was a good thing he did. Uh, but but uh, that not one Mormon, and they only had about a million Mormons back then, not one Mormon widow or man as far as that concerned widower ever went to a poor house they took care of their own and the early church uh, the great uh, testimony they had among the unsaved is behold how they love each other and so we are to do this in our local church and churches it's not to be a, a you know welfare organization but when we see someone who really needs uh, really needs our financial help we're to take care of them Okay, concerning widows in the church, concerning senior saints in the church, thank God for that, <laughs> and then concerning the elders in the church to be carefully chosen. And here is another, 1 Timothy 5.22, that uh, many uh, pastors probably and church members and co uh, pulpit committees have uh, failed miserably, lay hands suddenly on no man. That means don't ordain men that are not yet, they're novice, they're not, they, they're not grounded in the faith. And I think of three men, especially one and not involved in our ministry, but two that um, were right up there in the, in the top echelon with all the president of the Southern Baptist Convention and the politicians, etc. years ago, two young men that have and then had charisma oozing from their fingertips. Graduates, well, one only one, one semester, and then he came out, he was going to save the world. And, and they built great ministries for a while, but they down, not because of sexual immorality, but just about everything else. And I, I certainly think of the one guy that came here when it was dinner on the ground, uh, some, uh, well, it was 1972 during June. This guy, uh, we had 11, we had 18,000 
at the, at the, base, at the baseball stadium, and uh, we had, uh, he gave the invitation, we, we stood, there wasn't enough room in the bleachers there, and uh, 12,000 men, I'm sorry, 11,000 men came forward to rededicate their life. That was my first uh, family um, gathering here at Thomas Road, and I was here a few months before that, but Sue and I and Matt was there, and then he had, again, he, he was a man's man, and uh, the rascal, you never even heard about him anymore. And so lay hands suddenly on no man. Okay, all right. Um, if you turn now to page 10, uh, then he talks about the rich in the church. This is the 1%. <laughs> That's not a lot of us. <laughs> uh, most of it he talks about to the 99%. And then concerning servants. And then the third main division church officers, and the family of God. And he talks about the two offices in the church. There may be a third, a deaconess, and I have no problem if some churches have that in their constitution, godly women. But uh, the, the office of the pastor or bishop and the office of a deacon. Uh, qualifications for the office of a bishop. This is the true saying, if a man desires the office of bishop, he desires a good work. Now, at the bottom of the page, he must be a male. I know we have women pastoring even some Southern Baptist churches, but, but uh, it's the word anthropos, man. He must be a man. Now, if a woman has a sex change, I don't know how that works, but uh, it, 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 it's he, not she, okay? And he must be without reproach, not blameless, not sinless, but blameless, without reproach. And uh, World War III has been fought on this issue for many years. He must be the husband of one wife, and I'm not going to open up a, a lot of uh, wounds here tonight, maybe. But on page 11, there are two views on this, and you have to, uh, you know, sort it out yourself. There's the prohibition of polygamy view. And uh, some believe this, including uh, the former, and I didn't realize it, uh, he's a godly man, and one of my heroes, the, the former uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary. As, as I remember, John L. Walver took this position. And because uh, I was talking to him and, well, Brother Wilmington, where do you read that? And I, well, I'm not going to fight that, you know, because we were talking, we brought him here to give him an honorary degree and he's in heaven now. But then the polygamy uh, said, if a, if a man, a uh, godly man, he's in a church, he has four or five uh, wives, practicing to be a Mormon, I guess, uh, then, uh, and he wants to be a bishop, he has to, you know, get rid of four of them, at least, and keep the, the fifth one. Uh, but there are certain reasons why that possibly is not true. But the second view is uh, the prohibition of the divorce view. And this is the majority, although it's not uh, by any means all, that, uh, that would say that the only paid office in a local church that a divorced man uh, probably would not occupy is the office of the senior pastor. But uh, at any rate, uh, that's, you make your own mind there. I've tried to give you the reasons for it. Okay, he must be temperate, prudent, respectable, given to hospitality, able to teach, not given to wine, not pugnacious. He must be gentle, not contentious. He must be free from the love of money. He must be able to rule his own house well. And uh, that's been a problem to some pastors. And I don't think it's their fault. It just, you know, you can, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And God has given people free will, including pastors' kids. And, but uh, in general, he must rule his own house well. And then he must not be a novice or a new convert. And we've talked about this. Uh, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. See, that's what caused the first sin in the universe. Satan, he was Lucifer, the bright and shining one, and he fell, he was lifted up with pride. He was a novice. All right? <clears throat> and he must have a good reputation in the unsaved community as well as in the church. A man who pays his debts and uh, has a good testimony in his business and whatever. All right, and then the qualifications for a deacon, basically the same for a pastor. Okay, on the next page, 12. And then false teachers and the family of God. Their theology, their tactics, their transgressions. Their theology, now the Spirit speaketh expressly 
That means repeatedly that in the latter times, and I'm convinced that's today, some shall depart from the faith. Now, he's not talking about the Adolf Hitlers and the Mussolinis and, and uh, the Christer, uh, Christopher Hitchens and the Sam Harris and all these agnostics and, and the new atheists, the so-called. Uh, they never were in the faith. He's talking about those who profess but not possess. Uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then the substance of their teaching, their tactics, arguing, stirring up constant friction, their transgressions, they use the law in the wrong way, they allow their own conscience to be seared, they use the church for personal gain, they oppose the true faith with false theories of science. Uh, every week there's a new uh, finding in science. Now, I believe in scientists, science, but I have some problems with scientists. Uh, I wish I could get into this, uh, but I'll just say this. Uh, I, I take uh, two or three science magazines, and one of them uh, is, uh, the, they've been trying for many years to, uh, to get rid of the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle says that this, this world, this universe, Seemingly, our, our planet Earth was uh, was tailor made for life because there, you know, some I think Hugh Ross is a scientist, a Christian, and he's come up with about 40 or 50 uh, elements that we had to have, or it could not, you could not have life as we know it today. For example, if the sun were further away, uh, we'd freeze to death. If we were a little closer, we'd uh, we'd uh, fry, and then. Uh, Everything and just in it's you know in fact once one atheist said admittedly it seems like the universe uh, had us in mind well now they don't like that and so here's what they do there's one chance in a trillion that all these things could accidentally happen in our in our world in our universe they said yeah but now the new theory is multi universes and they say that there may be a universe born every single minute, and I, I quote some of this, that as many as one followed by 500, I've read that a number of times, 500 zeros times of universes, which means that at that, you know, anything is possible. Anything is possible in that many universes. Uh, the, the, the weirdest, most bizarre thing in order to get away from the, the fact staring in the face, hey, this world was created by a creator, you see. And uh, so at any rate, they, um, they just don't understand it. And, uh, and uh, the source and the subject of their teaching, arguing, stirring up friction, and they allow their own conscience. They oppose true faith with false theories of science. Then the Savior and the family. Paul offers a brief summary of Christ's work here in this epistle. And here's some glorious uh, words. And we're going to look at some of these hymns now. Uh, and I'll read the A and the, his incarnation. And you read uh, at the bottom of the page uh, what the hymn says. Okay. His incarnation. Reading. God was manifest in the flesh. Page 13. His purpose. Reading. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief who is the Savior of all men, his deity, now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, who only have immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom honor and power everlasting, amen. Now, the next one is uh, 1 Timothy 360, and this is uh, the second great hymn that most feel was one of the, uh, the second verse that most feel was the, the background of a hymn in the early church. His successful ministry, reading, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. So that uh, takes it from uh, the cross, or takes it from the manger to the mountain. Born in the manger, then to the mountain where he ascends into heaven, 
there to make intercession for believers. One verse, glorious hymn. John's going to find out uh, the, uh, the tune, and we're going to sing all four stanzas next week, maybe. All right, and then his suffering and death. Ready? I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. His resurrection, justified in the spirit, a reference to his resurrection, his ascension, received up into glory, his mediatorship, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I remember a class, I think it was Dallas, where the professor said, I'm going to give you, gentlemen, uh, a visual uh, illustration of the mediatorship of Jesus Christ. He said, physically, he said, Jesus died this way. No doubt about that with his hands outstretched. He said, theologically, he died this way with one hand taking the hand of God. See, there's an alienation, a gap between man and God. And God cannot look upon sin without judging him. With one hand, Jesus Christ, who was God, took hold of the Father's hand. With the other hand, Jesus Christ was also man. As much God had he never been man, as much man had he never been God. He took hold of man and he bridged the gap. Because the one ingredient necessary for a mediator is to have the confidence of both alienated parties. Okay? And uh, he had the confidence of God and he had the confidence of man. The mediator, one man, the mediator, Christ Jesus. All right? And uh, his suffering and death, his resurrection, his ascension, his mediatorship, his return. That thou keep the commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, his millennial reign, which in his time he shall show who is that blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. First Timothy. Okay, Second Timothy, the final, on page 14, the final words of God's finest witness. And... Uh, some believe that Jesus may have had the Apostle Paul in mind during the last part of his statement to the disciples. And um, he's talking at this time about uh, John the Baptist. And Jesus preached John the Baptist's funeral. He was a great man. In fact, he says, I tell you the truth at the funeral. Among them that are born of women, that takes care of most of us, though, and includes most of us, uh, there hath not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's several theories here, but, but Paul said on two occasions, I am the least of the saints. And so Jesus may have had the apostle Paul in mind. Of course, he said this before Paul was saved. Okay, and um, on page 15, some unique features. Number one, this epistle is his spiritual swan song, his dying shout of triumph. Galatians was the first epistle he wrote 2 Timothy would be his final. Paul writes more about last day conditions in this epistle than in any other. After being released from his first Roman imprisonment, Paul is once again arrested. This arrest may have taken place suddenly in Troas, thus explaining why Paul left there without taking his cloak, parchments, or Old Testament scrolls. Those uh, Roman Nazis arrested him and then he couldn't even uh, uh, gather anything out of uh, his place there. On July 19, AD 64, Rome was burned, probably by Nero, and the Christians were blamed. Christianity then became an illegal religion, and to evangelize, and Paul did a little of that in his spare time, was a crime punishable by death. Paul was probably arrested again sometime after July of AD 64 and condemned to death. During his second and final imprisonment, he wrote 2 Timothy. His second imprisonment was far different from the first. He was then, the first in Rome, a political prisoner awaiting trial. Uh, and he had his own house. He's in his own hired house. So he was under house arrest. But he is now, the second, a condemned criminal awaiting death. Then he lived in his own hired house. Now he huddles in a deep, dark dungeon. I've been there uh, many years ago, and uh, it is a terrible place there in Rome. 
And um, during his first imprisonment, he was visited by many, saved and unsaved. Now he is forsaken by all. All have forsaken me. And uh, what a, only Luke is with me. What a terrible testimony. So these friends, they just, uh, they were afraid that they weren't at his, at his, his, his uh, final uh, trial. Uh, number nine, this is the most personal letter that he ever wrote. In Romans, we see Paul the theologian. In 1 Corinthians, Paul the counselor. In 2 Corinthians, Paul the preacher. In Galatians, Paul the defender. In 1 Timothy and Titus, Paul the statesman. But here in 2 Timothy, Paul the man. All right, on page 16, number 10. This letter is rich in personal allusions. Paul mentions 23 men, women, friends, and foes. He also lists by name more enemies of the gospel in this epistle than any of that he wrote. All right, and uh, 13. At least six analogies depicting the Christian life are given here in this book. The believer is likened to a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, a student, a vessel, and a servant. Uh, number 14. Tradition says Paul was imprisoned in the, this prison that I talked about, which he had only two cells, one below the other, with Paul occupying the lower cell. When I was over there, well, I was at the top, and that was horrible, but I could only just imagine what the lower one must have been. Number 15. This epistle has much to say about the Word of God. In fact, he says more about it in this epistle than any other single epistle, one of his shortest. Its message is never to enchains, though the messenger may be. It is to be proclaimed, to be studied, to be correctly interpreted. It has been personally given by God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and in righteousness. It will be perfect the believer's character and service for God. It is to be passed on to others. It will be uh, abandoned and opposed by its enemies in the last days. And number 16, I said he describes himself by more titles, but look at the very last one, a departing pilgrim. He said, the hour of my departure is at hand. Not my death, but my departure. Uh, someone has said, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Nero, uh, you're not killing me. You're just cashing, uh, you're just uh, fixing my ticket for heaven. And God is sending a special angel to get me. My departure is at hand. All right, and then uh, the top of page 17, a victorious fighter. In fact, in three short verses, Paul offers a threefold summary of his entire ministry. And uh, hopefully this could say, we could say these things as we look back on our ministry. Regarding the past, let's read this. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Some time in graduate school, right before a test, we'd pervert this verse and say, I fought a good fight, but this course has finished me, you know, but that's not what he said. And then regarding the present, right now, reading, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand, regarding the future. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance." He, number 18, he once, he once may have believed that he would partake of the rapture, but now realize that this would not be the case. That's very interesting when I read about that the first time some years ago. In chapter uh, 4 of 1 Thessalonians, he says that, uh, you know, the Lord shall descend from heaven the voice, and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Then he says, then we, then we that are alive shall be caught up to meet them in the air. But uh, now he realizes so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, always right. I mean, it, what he wrote was right, but his, his interpretation, he thought, okay, I'm going to be in that. We that are alive and remain. Uh, but now he says, the hour of my departure is at hand. A big difference between 1 Thessalonians 4 and here in the last part of the book of 2 Timothy. All right, and number 19. He had previously presented his body to live for Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He now presents it to die for Christ. His dying words echo those once said by Stephen. Stephen's words at his time of his death reading. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, Lord, don't punish my persecutors here. 
And then Paul's words reading, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsake me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. The, the, at my first answer, my first hearing, uh, no man. He had a lot of friends, a lot of friends in Rome. In fact, he talks about those in Philippians. He said, we have, you know, right from Caesar's household, uh, there's all kinds, but, but I don't know what happened. Uh, well, they just, they just uh, didn't feel they could uh, support him. And no man, but he said, please, dear Lord, don't lay that to their charge. Among the names mentioned in this epistle, two stand out in contrast to each other. John Mark and Demas. John Mark, who had once forsaken Paul during his first missionary journey, but now was ministering for God. And Paul says, okay, uh, Luke, bring this and this and this. But uh, above all, Timothy, above all, bring my copies uh, my scrolls. I want to learn a little more about the Bible, the Old Testament before I die. But bring John Mark to me because he is profitable now. Uh, say this is, uh, uh, John Mark reminds me of Jonah in the Old Testament. Jonah chapter 1, God is, uh, calls him to go to Nineveh and uh, he doesn't do it. And uh, Jonah chapter 2, is God allows the fish to uh, swallow him. And um, then in chapter 3, it begins with these thrilling words. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. He is the God of the second chance. How many chances? I've blown it. Thank God. Uh, it's not even three strikes and you're out. Sometimes it's 30. Uh, but here, he is now profitable. First, he wasn't. He's now profitable. And But Demas... Now, we've argued, the theologians have argued, I'm not a theologian, uh, Bible students, uh, whether he was saved or lost. Uh, demons who had once ministered for God, but now had forsaken Paul, uh, whether he was saved or not, I, I don't know. And then you have the comparison with other Bible books, titles and types for Jesus. And I've got about six minutes to go through First Timothy. Uh, Paul, the preacher, whereunto I'm appointed a preacher and apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And I have uh, summarized uh, these uh, four chapters. Uh, Paul the preacher, chapter 1. Paul the pattern in chapter 2. Paul the prophet in chapter 3. Paul the pil pilgrim in chapter 4. Uh, you have the preacher and his student. What he says about Timothy. And, uh, and then uh, at the top of uh, page uh, 19. Uh, and we'll go down to, uh, that's Paul the, Paul the preacher. And then Paul the pattern. Uh, let's read this in the middle of the page. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, what I'm going to do in January, not just here also, but I'm going to, uh, hopefully if we can arrange this with the powers that be, academia, is to uh, teach uh, in the D-Men program, the doctor ministry program. And I've, I'll be teaching also probably, uh, the, the, there'll be an intensive over there. It'll be eight hours a day for four and a half days. I'll begin with the doctrine of salvation. And I'm going to tell these pastors, I said, okay, now gentlemen, here's the situation. I think these are the steps a pastor has to take if he's going to be a successful pastor in explaining the word of God. First of all, there is information. Tell the people what the text says. And then secondly, interpretation. Tell them what it means. Third is illustration, how they can understand it. Fourth is application, how they can apply it to their lives. Now, I've been to uh, three different seminaries, and all four, of the, all three of those seminaries have gone through those steps, but they forget, they do not include the fifth state, which is communication. How to take these words, how to take these great doctrines and apply them so that the congregation can understand. And so I, wanna, I, want, I want to do that, and of course with you folks also. All right, uh, so he talks about, um, let's see, where are we here? Um, okay. Um, Okay, Paul the pattern, all right. The child of God is assigned a threefold duty concerning the word of God. Uh, we are to receive it from others. We are to regard it within ourselves. We are to remit it to others, to state it another way. This is inspired by God himself. We are to read it, heed it, deed it. 
and seed it to our children, okay? And then, so uh, he's Paul the pa- uh, he calls it the pattern. He's a soldier, he's an athlete, he's a farmer, he's a sufferer. And then on page 20, and uh, we'll skip over some of this and uh, go on to, let's see, uh, page 21. Paul the prophet, Paul the prophet, page 21. Middle of page, Roman numeral three, reading. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, the symptoms of this final day disease, I give a lot of them, but I want you to look down. And here is one of the signs of the last days that I've seldom seen in any prophetical books. You know, you talk about the uh, revived Roman Empire and Israel back in the land, and et cetera, et cetera. But Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 3, that men I have here, they will be unleaving. But in the Greek, it's they shall be without, uh, the, the Greek, uh, the English word, without natural affection. And without natural affection comes from one Greek word, stergen, S-T-E-R-G-E-I-N. And I remember Dr. Kenneth Wiest in 1955, 1954, took a course in 2 Timothy, and he said, gentlemen, this, is, this word is only used twice in the, in, the entire New Testament of the three Greek words. There is, uh, of course, agape love. Uh, that's a love that's not uh, dependent upon the, uh, the, the, the beauty of the object being loved. God just decides to love us, and we're unlovely. Then there's a phileo, which means a friendly love, and uh, the love that Jonathan had for David, that Jesus had for Mary and, and uh, Martha and Lazarus, but sturgeon. And he said, that's a gravitational love. He said, that's a love that animals have for their own. Uh, And he said, uh, now, gentlemen, I still remember this. He said, I may not live to see this. And he didn't. He died a few years later. But some of you will. And this old guy was one of the students who remembered. He said, the day will come where moms and dads will not have the same love for their offspring that barnyard animals have for theirs. Who would have thunk that on January the 22nd, 1973, that prophecy was fulfilled? Do you realize that since that time, America has murdered, I looked it up uh, last week, 56 million of their babies. 56 million without natural affection. All right. Uh, And I have this uh, at the bottom of the page. You can check it out here. On page 22, again, you can have the uh, symptoms of the last days here. And uh, the solution for the final day's disease, continue in the work of God like Nehemiah. Nehemiah, he was building the walls around Jerusalem, and he refused to come down. He said, we're doing a great thing. We can't answer all your objections. We're going to do what we're going to do. And then continue in the Word of God. Okay, uh, I think, uh, too, uh, there's a reason why, and I'll close with this. I do not uh, feel all the gifts are for today. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, probably March or April, we'll talk about this. Um, because of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and this is the last uh, few paragraph, last paragraph on page 22. Uh, I do not think the gift of tongues is necessary today. The gift of miracles, we can walk on water. The gift of raising people from the dead. Why not? Because of the perfect gift, the Bible. Let's read this. It's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Uh, Paul says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, perfectly equipped to do everything. In other words, it's the the B-I-B-L-E. Now, as it come in a minute, I want to um, just have to skip over um, and, and, and close with a, uh, you got the notes on the rest, of a hymn that uh, we're not going to sing, that we're going to sing what we usually do, but um, the songwriter has, Isaac Watts, has written this song, it's not in your notes, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? And he asks three penetrating questions, and then he hopefully gives the answer. Here are the questions, not in your notes. <clears throat> 
First question, am I, Paul talks about a soldier. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Second question, must I be carried to the skies in flowery beds of ease while others sought, sought fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Am I, are there no foes for me to fight? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me unto God? No. Fourth stanza. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Father, we thank you for the example, the end sample of the Apostle Paul. We remember on no less than five occasions in his various epistles, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And we look to Paul not as a savior, but as an example. And we ask that we might do what he did with our lives.